Hey, and welcome back. This is the Imperial Riff Lord signing on again for episode 8 of the History of the Guitars. This is Ruthless. This is a between an 88 and a 91 Hamer Californian. And I do not know the exact date it was made because there's no serial number on the back. Somebody sanded it off or something, uh, and there wasn't one in the, inside the neck pocket either uh, the first time I, when I first got it. But uh, this is an amazing guitar. It started out as a Corvette. I turned it into a Ferrari with some serious help from a couple people, but namely my dearly departed brother, Nick Appelman, which more on that later. Um, a lot of history with this guitar. This is going to be a little longer episode than normal, but that's okay. A lot of specs and a lot of a lot of details. So, came about this guitar in May of 2011. I had just graduated GIT a couple months before that, and my friend Cat, who knew where all the good pawn shops with all the bargains and all the cool gear were at, um, went with me and two or three other friends. It was my friend Kevin, and I remember Alec, Alec DeCurver, Kevin Therian. Kevin was my drummer in a couple of bands. I saw him recently for the first time in a few years. He was my roommate out here when we were students. And I grabbed a few hundred bucks in cash because I hadn't bought a new guitar in several years. And uh, just wanted to buy something, you know. And I also didn't have, I had a few months before I had to start making student loan payments at the time. So, I uh, found this at the last pawn shop we went to. It was just a few blocks from Amoeba Records on Sunset at the time. And I remember I got a, I think I got 50 bucks off on the guitar because my my friend wanted to buy a, a, a Vox Wah pedal. And she said she would buy it if, if he gave me a deal on the guitar. And I forget, I think I gave, I only gave 300 bucks for this thing when I got it. Um, I might have saw the receipt somewhere. I'm not sure. It came in a Fender gig bag of some sort. And I was not sure about getting it until my friend Alec came by and saw that it has 27 frets on it. And he's like, oh, that's a total shred machine. Uh, and it absolutely is. It is. The neck is super thin. It's one of my favorite necks I've ever had. Um, and then it's got the extended fretboard. So I went ahead and bought it, and it uh, it just grew on me after a little while. I didn't love it at first. It was a cool guitar, but I didn't bond with it for a little while. Um, started using it at my teaching job, which I still have right away. And uh, not long after that, I had the pickups upgraded. So it was the first guitar I changed all the pickups in. So let's get to the specs of what all's in and on this thing. So the first thing that I did uh, before anything else was I changed out the pickups. They were Duncan designed when I got it. The, the neck pickup, I don't know what it was, but it was this weak single coil. I am humbucker man, hear me roar. Uh, I got nothing against single coils. They do sound cool when the right applications, but th it was just a really weak sounding pickup and it just had to go. It didn't have much power or personality to it at all. So I replaced it with the DiMarzio Air Norton S because a full-size humbucker, as you can tell, won't fit in here because of the angled fretboard. Um, so this is a stacked single coil where it means the, the coils are stacked on top of each other, so it's a humbucker that fits in a single coil pickup slot. You can see the dual blade pull pieces on there. And then this is a DiMarzio Crunch Lap. Um, and I ordered both of those, had the, had the tech at the store at the time, Joe installed both of them, immediate, what I said, called, what I said, when I plugged it into my 5150 with both cabinets, the first time, let her rip in the room that I had it in, I, total tone gasm, badass, immediate upgrade, never ever taken them out of there, perfect, uh, absolutely perfect, uh, upgrade, just did everything I needed to do. Really simple. There's the bridge, three way switch, middle, and the neck. Very simple, one volume, just like the Jackson in the previous episode, Jonathan. 
uh, no tone, just master volume. I believe there was another knob on this thing, as somebody pointed out to me recently, because there's an indent on the body underneath here, right about there. It seems like there may have been one on there. Uh, only thing about this guitar I don't like is where the pickup selector is located. Because if you're messing around with the bar and you're going at it, my pick hand always stays right about here. You have to reach behind it to switch pickups. Which I don't do that often mid-song mid anyway, but it would have been nicer if they put it, I'll say over here, you can just flick it like a Les Paul or something. Um, I don't think it's worth bothering with modifying the guitar to have that though. It's not that big a deal. Um, got uh, maple neck and rosewood fretboard with uh, alder body and then uh, bolt on neck and then you've just got uh, original Floyd Rose because this is an old guitar this is between an 88 and a 91 from the, all the research I did on it I believe it's Korean but I'm not sure if it's a fancier model than some of the other ones because if you find some of these like the the uh, really elaborate ones there i think they would literally call them californian elites they were like five six grand or more they were super high end and even these are getting to be where they cost a whole lot more i, I could have bought one for a couple hundred bucks it was a natural finish yeah idiot should have done that a uh, long time ago but i didn't so you know these are ernie ball strap locks i replaced these as well and then um, the rest of the guitar, uh, when I first got it, the neck was bare. It wasn't even sealed. So I took some time and sealed it with tongue oil, which didn't turn out to be the greatest job, but I got it dealt with and made sure that it was uh, taken care of right eventually. Um, as far as the rest of the specs, the there's practically only a few things on this guitar that are stock because I I tore the whole thing apart so in 2017 my friend Nick Appelman God rest his soul pain in my ass you were but I miss you um, he's I wanted to learn how to work on guitars because he was the best tech I ever knew um, and I lived with him for four and a half years so um, he said, you're going to get the whole, the full Monty. We're going to tear this entire thing apart. On my musician page on Facebook, I've got an album of pictures of the whole guitar in pieces. So after I replaced the pickups, the only, the only thing of stock on this guitar is the neck, the body, the bridge, and the switch. So we replaced the, the nut and he refretted the whole thing he he did it in less than two days because he was in competition with my my other good buddy moshe to see who could do the refret at the highest level of quality the fastest i believe nick won he was just that he was the overachiever when it came to that and it's still flawless first time i bent a note on it after these you can see these frets from a distance they're freaking gigantic and i love them but um uh, he did that, and the coolest fact about this is that when he was refretting it, Glenn Tipton of Judas Priest came into the ESP guitar shop in North Hollywood, because at the time, they were just given Glenn Tipton a signature model. Uh, it was one of their Vipers, very similar to an SG, um, uh, because uh, that's just where it was going, but I've never seen Glenn actually play it live. still plays his old Hamer Phantom live whenever he does play now live with Priest as it's been limited to the last several years because of his unfortunate uh, continuation of Parkinson's asshole of a disease. That's why the Judas Priest After Show sticker is on the back because in October of 2015 we got on Nick got us backstage for Judas Priest at Knotfest so Priest paid for our tickets we got backstage I got to ask Glenn about the Beyond the Realms of Death Solo one of the greatest days of my entire life. And initially when I bought this guitar, I didn't even think about it. Holy shit, Glenn took the place hammers. So, you know, it was way cooler after that. Um, but uh, once we tore this entire guitar apart, we replaced the springs in the back. I recently had those redone because they were just worn out. They were squeaking. It wasn't staying in tune right. Uh, the input jack was replaced. The volume pot was replaced. 
I replaced this pickup ring a year or two ago to match the hardware, or at least to match the the uh, the bridge posts. Moshe gave gave me those. Thank you, Moshe. Um, the switch is stock. We didn't replace that that I can remember. Um, and then I found the tuners, which are Godos. You can see it says you can't see it from here probably, but it says made in Japan on the back. I found those on Craigslist for like twenty two bucks for a set of them. Probably they're 70 80 bucks or more um, and then we painted the entire interior of the guitar all the cavities with shielding paint to make a super low noise operation and then the inside of this here has got copper shielding on it as well so super super dead quiet um, so it's it is a it's definitely not stock at all and I don't care because it is such a smooth amazing playing guitar you know, it takes no effort to play this thing whatsoever. Um, just checking the time here. We got a little time yet. Cool. Um, so as far as why I named it Ruthless, um, my friend, well, I consider him a friend. I haven't talked to him for a long time, but my former teacher, and I feel like he's a friend, um, I haven't talked to him for a while, reached out, I'm going to do that and send him a link to this video because I don't think he's on Facebook anymore. I know he's on Instagram. Greg Harrison at GIT when I was a student there. He was my private teacher and single string rhythm and RSW rhythm section workshop teacher for six months. The second uh, set of quarters I was there. Um, he always talked about, you know, and he's a, a demon of a guitarist. I mean, you can play just about anything flawlessly, no matter what the technical level of it is. And just an amazing, fun guy, really inspiring, taught me a shitload of things and really helped me a lot with my playing. He's my second favorite teacher uh, that I've had in the guitar playing realm just because, I mean, just a, an entertaining guy too. Not as, not as uh, loud as Steiger because nobody holds that title except for Ken Steiger. But he always talked about, you know, being ruthless with your attack and ruthless with your playing and just really being on in that headspace of I'm going to be savage in my pursuit of mastery of this thing. And that always stuck with me. So um, since he is the best shredder I know personally, uh, I wanted to name this guitar after him. So I, I did a very long time ago. I've had this since again, since 2011. Um, but uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, I was actually teaching a student out of your uh, shred book for the, that you had for the class on economy picking yesterday. So I recommend he get himself a copy because all those techniques are super valid. Um, so as far as the history of this guitar, besides where I got it, the specs, the working on it with Nick, Glenn Tipton came into the shop, couldn't have been blessed more greatly than that. It would have been so awesome if he could have autographed it, but you know, what are you going to do? Um, Used it in my first band in after I got out of school uh, called Heavy Justice. I played seven shows with them. Did one recording on one solo. It's called Fuel Into the Fire, very Metallica esque. Very, it's a thrash, old school thrash metal band. Um, used it through my original my amp, amp, the amp I still have, my original 5150 head through a Mesa 412 at a studio. I believe it was in Torrance somewhere. Um, it's on SoundCloud. Did a little EP where it only had two songs on it. And then uh, didn't use it on any other recordings after that. Because I haven't done a lot of recording in my career, but I'm going to definitely be changing that soon. Um, and then I played it at every show with them. And haven't used it in too many other bands. I mean, I played it with Groupies Wanted here and there with one of my bands I was in when I moved back to Indiana almost. 10 years ago, actually over 10 years ago. Um, in 2012, I moved back there. So I played with them until late 2013, early 2014. Uh, but this was a, not a guitar I, I got out real often at the time. Um, and uh, it was, a, it was a, I forget if I mentioned or not, it was the first guitar I bought in LA. And the uh, for the longest time, I couldn't even play it and enjoy it because it wouldn't stay in tune even after all the stuff Nick and I did to it for about a year it was like that and he was going to re-drill the nut until he was like let's let's investigate all the possibilities before you do any major surgery on this thing well usually most of your Floyd Rose guitars have what you call a string retainer right here 
that metal bar that goes across the strings is well it was the wrong one and it was depressing the strings too far and creating the wrong angle of tension on them and so it would stay in tune with the amp so he just took the string retainer off and it's been fine ever since so uh I'm trying to think of anything else i've used it on or used it for i know i'm going to be using it in some upcoming videos i want to do the beyond the realms of death solo and the touch of evil solo any priest videos or anything that I'm going to use or, or learn to play on. If I ever in a priest tree, it's got to be this guitar. There's just no question about that. Um, I've got a matching a strap that matches it nicely. Um, and uh, I found a case for it. It's the exact same uh, company and almost the same exact case as Eddie came with. That was the first, not came with, but I bought it for it. Well, the freestyle case company uh, that was the first hard case I ever bought so that was cool so I have two of them now just a little bit different design than the one that I have this in uh, but uh, besides that in 12 years I can't think of anything super significant that I've used it on in that amount of time besides the heavy justice um, I didn't play any any shows with my next band glass wolf and then even since I've been back in LA, oh, I played it in my, my last gig with the Stephen G. Williams band, the very heavy Satriani meets science fiction-y kind of thing, instrumental band, only band I've ever been in as, an, as a rhythm player exclusively, even though in our first show we only did three, unfortunately. Um, I did play a solo on one song. But I, I love that man. I keep in touch with Steve all the time. I really miss playing with him. I hope we get to do it again sometime. Whenever I'll, I'll be, I'll be there for it. Uh, but that was one of the last shows I played it at. Um, so that's all I can think of for now on this one. Uh, hope you've enjoyed this episode eight of Ruthless eighty eight between an eighty eight and a ninety one Hamer Californian. Uh, if you can get one of these great uh likely won't be as tricked out as this one unless you get one of the deluxe ones i don't know the specs on them exactly um but again they they are becoming rarer that i know of and uh depending on which exact one you get they can be rather expensive but i'm super super happy with this one and uh it's definitely one i'm never ever going to get rid of so thanks for tuning in if you like what you see hit the subscribe button thanks for the support leave a comment below until next time Imperial Rift Lord signing off, up the irons, and listen to Painkiller, the greatest metal album of all time. I don't give a rat's ass what anybody says. It is fact, and it is the law, and I have spoken. So, see you on the next one. Peace.